All right, 10 minute snack. Everyone knows the rules. Let's eat. All right, we, today we got Jeff Smith with us. Jeff, thank you for being on. He is the owner of Co Colorado Craft Beef, which is a ranch that I believe now has over 5,000 acres in operation for over 100 years, ships high quality beef right to your doorstep. Jeff, thanks for being on today. Of course, thank you very much for having me. So the burning question I have for you is most consumers are disconnected from their food source and yep. you are the at the source of the food source. And when people think of beef production, they often think of um, CAFO operations, co concentrated animal feed operations. They think of hormone injections and antibiotics. They think of poor feed for, to me and uh, you know, and really the question I have for you today is, what is the reality of beef production, specifically in America? And I know it's different around the world, but like in America, what is reality and what is, dare I say, propaganda? <laughs> sure. So the reality is in the protein markets. So if we talk chicken, pork, turkeys to some degree, and cattle, cattle are the vast difference of the market. Most of the other protein sources are vertically integrated. They're owned by a company or two you're contracted to produce. The beef space is so much more than that. We have you know, hundreds and thousands of families producing 100, 200, 300 animals, and they do aggregate at some of those CAFOs. They do aggregate in feed yards, and then they do go through a processing system for most of the processing in the country that's owned by four companies. That's just the capitalistic nature of it. Um, and there's positives and negatives to both sides of that system, right? So if we take just the sheer volume that those four big players do, man, we can't do that on our own. We kind of need them. These cattle all have a reason in it to exist, and that's to be on a plate. And we can do things a little differently at Colorado Craft Beef, but I can't feed all of Denver. So some of the things that are propaganda is one of the things you mentioned, like bad feed. Man, these animals have nutritionists watching their diet every day. The bunks that, even if you're in a feed yard, the bunks are read every day to determine intake. Uh, is, it being, is it correct for the environment they're in? Is it hot? Is it humid? Is it cold? Do we need to bump it up? So I would say the biggest piece of propaganda in the beef industry especially is that it's not a caring system. Hmm. Um, you know, there are growth promotants that are used in some, some form and fashion in the system, and that is commodity driven, it's capitalism driven. The math behind it is on a, on a you really can't argue with. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's something we at Colorado Craft Beef don't do. Um, we choose not to do that. And for that, we have to have a higher price. And that's yep. just a natural trade-off. And that's really when it comes to the food system, you have to pay for the quality you want. You got to put your money where your mouth is. Exactly. Where your priorities are. And I'm not saying either side is right or wrong. I'm just saying some sides are different. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you can feed your family and you have to buy, and, and your, your finances make you buy at the grocery store, you have to be a little more careful with what you purchase because of financial reasons. Man, feed your family. Yep. Love, love the opportunity to do that. We donate a ton of product. We sell super discounted product to local food banks. We do everything we can to help because it's going to take all of us. Yep. And we can't demonize somebody else if they can't do the thing we think they should do. We can't make people feel bad. And at the end of the day, nobody's out intentionally harming animals. I mean... I've been wrecked a few times by cows or horses or pigs or whatever growing up. Um, and that's just the nature of the game. But I think the biggest propaganda piece is that producers don't care. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the case. Yep. So two interesting things to maybe piggyback on this is one is we talk about quality and how these, these cattle are raised. One is, I, I guess the first part is the, the labeling. There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, uh, I don't want to say misdirection, but confusion in labeling. And then 
So if you could just talk a minute about different kinds of labeling, and then what is the difference in the quality of those meats under those different kind of labelings? So my standard answer on the labels is if the labels really matter to you, don't buy for the labels. <laughs> my standard answer is if the labels matter, find a producer, talk to them, get to know them, support that producer. Yeah. Because if you go to the highest end grocery store without mentioning any companies, most of that beef is still commodity beef somehow. Mm -hmm. We are not certified organic Colorado craft beef. We're not certified non-antibiotic. We're not certified non-hormone because it costs a ton of money. But I can tell you where every one of those cattle came from. I can tell you the origin story down to the day of when they moved place to place. And our prices don't need to be driven up by label claims. So in general, if you're buying something in the store and it has every label under the sun, every one of those labels comes with a price. And most of the time when you find a very nicely decorated package with some of the best labels everybody claims to know, most of that comes from the commodity beef sector. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you think that buying a different label means you're buying a different product, that's usually not the case. Mm. Um, it's a gray area. I'm not saying anybody's doing anything you know, unjust, but I believe there is a little bit of misinformation. Yeah, not malicious, but maybe, you know, marketing. It's capitalism, angles. man. <laughs> it's capitalism. Uh, so nutrition. And to me, I, I think of kind of the cattle, maybe two nutrition buckets, but I want to add a third here. One is gra conventional grass-fed grain-finished beef mm -hmm. versus grass-fed grass-finished beef versus the one that I don't have the answer. I'm really curious. And I, I, I'm not even sure if there's research done on this is I tend to, I think I see a difference in beef that the cattle are older, meaning they've spent a lot of time on grass. So can you tell me about maybe the nutritional similarities or differences between these? Nutritional is going to be out of my wheelhouse. Okay. Um, my understanding is that the nutrition across the board is not that different. Yeah. You know, the grass finish groups will claim that there's a certain level of omega this, omega that, or whatever it may be. Uh, but some other people that I've listened to on this topic, like uh, Danny Vega is a good, good reference. I've been on his podcast. Yes, there's 20% difference of whatever macro it may be, but it's 20% of almost nothing, which is still almost nothing. <laughs> yeah. So that's my understanding. Uh, I do not claim to be a scientist. I'm an Excel and money nerd at heart. <laughs> uh, what I can talk about though is flavor and meat quality. Mm. So if we look at grass fed, grass finished, typically those animals are going to be a little older. They're going to have a yellow fat. If they're truly grass finished, that's the hard part is this grass finishing label that some people claim and it's a little in the gray because they're trying to get the same flavors green finished and that's how they sell more product. Right. Total that we could talk about that for an hour. Yep. But truly grass finished, like something you'll get from people in Georgia or something like that. It's going to be a yellow fat. That's going to have a little gamier flavor. They're usually not going to have enough fat cover that you can age them in a cooler long enough to get the same tenderness you'll get in grain finished. Um, so you're going to have this more pungent, uh, not as buttery type flavor where a lot of people just don't expect that with beef. Yep. Uh, with the grass fin or grass fed grain finish side, you get a white fat. And from a metabolic standpoint, what's happening there is the yellow fat actually contains a lot of beta carotene that comes from grass. That's yep. the flavor that you're getting. When the fat turns white, you flush that beta carotene. That's where that buttery flavor comes from. You get that with grain finished and with grain finished, you get enough of a fat cover on the carcass that you can age for a week or two, or like we do at Colorado Craft Beef, we age for 21 days. So you get, start, you get enzymes working, breaking down the meat. You get a lot more tender steak. You don't usually get that with grass finished because it will start to mold the meat because there's not fat cover. When you look at more mature cattle, they have a tendency to lay down uh, intermuscular fat last, but they're a little older. Um, there's a little difference because they're 
uh, connective tissue starts to calcify, they get some other issues along those lines. Um, but vintage beef is a alive and well concept in Europe. They really love it. Um, so you can certainly get high quality beef that's a little older, but at the end of the day, most of the time to overcome some of the tenderness issues you'll have on an older animal, they will offset that with a grain finish. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Jeff, one last question, just because sure. I had it in my notes and I'm, I, I just don't know the answer. Uh, glyphosate. And I heard, I, I've heard you talk on this a little bit. What are your thoughts on glyphosate toxins accumulating in fat tissue? Is that in your wheelhouse <laughs> on the beef side? Yeah. So on the beef side, most feed that animals are exposed to have never seen glyphosate. Uh, you know, there are some alfalfa and, and just to back up for your listeners, glyphosate is Roundup. That's what everybody knows it has. Glyphosate is the active ingredient. There is a study out from Oregon State University that talks about glyphosate in mammals and the fact that mammals cannot met or cannot metabolize glyphosate. Actually, if you ingest glyphosate or Roundup, as it were, the thing that actually affects you is the surfactant, which is the soap that will actually, you know, may, maybe give you a little diarrhea. It'll upset your stomach. But in general, most cattle, like all of our cattle that are on grass, those pastures have never been treated with anything ever. <laughs> and yep. my wife's family has owned that ground since 1913. It doesn't pay to treat it. Mm -hmm. um, there may have been some treatment on corn or other grain type stuff, but there are withdrawal periods that you cannot harvest within. All this stuff is monitored. It's all regulated for the feed system. Mm -hmm. And while I, while I will say I'm not a advocate of glyphosate, I think we should have better solutions. What I would say is the other solutions we have right now, gramoxone, some of those other chemicals are nasty. Mm. They are really, really, really bad. Um, Roundup gets a bad rap because it's so commonly known. It's mostly overused in the residential and consumer space because, you know, well, you're going to mix up a little bit to spray some weeds in your driveway. Well, a little bit is okay, but a lot's way better. Well, if you're doing that on fields of corn that are thousands of acres and you double your cost because you want more chemical, that's just, that doesn't work in ranching and farming. Right. Doesn't um, so what I would say is much like we talked about animal welfare, nobody's trying to use extra chemicals. Nobody's trying to burn down the ground. Do we need to monitor it? A thousand percent. We need to do the research. We need to understand. We need to find better solutions. But I have a great parting comment for you. Um, I read this one time and an auto mechanic walked up to a heart surgeon and said, hey, we kind of have the same job. I work on machines and make sure they run well. And you, the heart surgeon, you do kind of the same thing. And the heart surgeon's comment was, you know, you're correct. But I have to do it without letting the machine stop running. So when we think about that anecdote in an agricultural standpoint, we saw what happened with COVID. We saw the, the supply chain issues that were a bobble in the grand scheme of things that detonated people's ability to get food they wanted. Mm -hmm. All I would say is, yes, we need to make changes. Ag is not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Right. But we cannot totally tear the Band-Aid off without having a solution that keeps everybody fed. Yep. Yep. Perfect parting answer. Jeff, appreciate the time. Uh, and yeah, this knowledge, I think, is, you know, we'll, we'll of course, share it everywhere we can. But again, thank you for the time. And I think an important perspective that gets lost in the conversation. Yeah. I mean, nobody's perfect. I mean, if yep. you want, if, if you're driving an electric car, that's great. But where is that power coming from? It might be a coal fire lunch. plant. Yeah. Like nothing's ever free. Like we have to understand the bigger picture and we have to, as a society, work towards being correct not work towards being right. Yep. Yep. Perfect. All right, Jeff, I appreciate the time, especially right after your jujitsu. Uh, so go cool down, have a steak again. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Have a great day. Thanks. You See too. Bye-bye. Snack time's over. Did you enjoy the snack? 
If so, drop me a comment. Let me know if we should dive deeper and do a full meal on this topic. Also, P.S. If you liked the snacks, you're gonna love our bites. A daily email bite, a golden nugget, better than a pasture raised egg yolk. All right, maybe not that good, but it is a daily bite to optimize your health and nutrition with a meat-based diet. Access right now is totally free. Link below, see you in the bites.